Welcome to the show today, and it's packed full, you guys. <laughs> I read Prince Harry's books, so you don't have to. I'm going to tell you what I think, and it's been a hard book to read. Also, I have a special guest on the show, a lead priest uh, who does deliverance and exorcism, and also his friend, Ryan Bethia, who's also one of my friends, who've made a podcast together that you're going to want to listen to about exorcism and deliverance. It's crazy. Christians need to know about this right now. Also, I have a word for you about prodigals coming home in 2023. This and pressing news stories coming up on the Sean Bull Show right now. But we have members just like you joining every week on YouTube to support our show. And this week, I want to do shout outs to Elaine Riley and Janine and tell our members of all of our chat Q&A and small green room is coming up in a few weeks. So if you're a member, you can be a part of those. Make sure that you are a member so that we can have these like really, I, I just think authentic green room type chats to, and it's live, it's over video like this. We let the last one be on video so you guys could see what it was like and it was open to the public during the time it was out. And we actually grew in some members because of that. But we wanna see you guys on there. So join our channel right now at YouTube. If you're joining us from Facebook and Rumble, welcome. We're so glad you guys are here. Please leave comments, tell us what you're thinking and also tell us where you're coming in from. But right now, let's talk about this week's top news stories. And this is an intense week of news. Right now we found out that class file files were found in Biden's personal home. And a number of Biden's personal property, uh, they were found by staff and they were turned in. AGP tapped special counsel to investigate new classified docs found in Biden's garage next to his Corvette and also in the trunk of his Corvette. Biden acknowledged this on January 12th that a document, he just said one document of classified markings from his time as vice president was found in his personal library. But now we know there's many more along with other documents found in his garage and also at the school he teaches at or that he's supposedly a teacher at, when confronted about the documents during the press conference, Biden indicated he felt documents were safe in his garage because he keeps it locked since it is also houses his Corvette that's very precious to him. But this was highly illegal and irresponsible as media outlets leaning both ways have expressed and comparing the Trump documents with the Biden documents, some political experts have pointed out that a president has the power to declassify documents and they can actually be in his possession while a vice president does not. Ongoing investigations, as you guys have noted in the news, I'm sure you've seen this if you're in America, at least, that uh, his staff found in other places are now in full effect. So these investigations are going to continue and we'll keep you updated as they go on. Another story we have is the World Health Organization wants to go forward with a worldwide vaccination passport. A key committee of the World Health Organization is moving ahead with plans to demand vaccine passports for glo global travel uh, the WHO's International Health Regulations Review Committee, IHRRC, is meeting and has met last week, but also this week, to finalize amendments to its international health regulations, the IHR, including the passports. The 76th World Health Assembly is scheduled to occur on May 2023, and the IHRRC is pushing for the World Health Conference to institute a system of digital or paper, glo paper global health vaccine passports, according to Liberty Council, a Christian religious rights law firm. The idea is concerning to many Christians, including myself, who are conservative, because it could lead to more government control over individuals' lives and privacy. Additionally, this proposal raises questions regarding the ethics, I can't ever say that word, the ethics and efficacy of vaccinations. Don't you love that this is live and I can't change that? But it really does pose that question, the potential unequal access to these vaccines based on economic and social injustices, and the potential goal of the passport, which could be to control personal finances, employment, and other aspects of life, in addition to simply providing immunity. You have to realize like in a free country like America, there's already a battle going on over vaccines, but if you're in a country that there can't be a battle over this, that there's no restitution, like there's government institutes that are being sued right and left in America, and people are winning because of the vaccines. But in other countries, this is just not so. And so this could be a really control element to a dictatorship or to a country that's like a Muslim country that would just be detrimental. And so we want to pray into this and really believe that God has a higher way, that the people who are leading the World Health Organization would not be the ones who are making the final dictation on this the way that they're doing it now, but that God would raise up another solution because this is just not it. Well, Andrew Tate, man, Andrew Tate is, <laughs> it's concerning to see one of the most powerful social media influencers has been banned from almost every platform. I think every platform is banned him except for some of the fringy ones. Andrew Tate is in jail in Romania, particularly given the serious accusations against him, which include human trafficking. As Americans, of course, we believe everyone should be considered innocent until proven guilty. And we hope that the legal system in Romania is fair and just, but it's important that issues such as this are brought to light in order to ensure the protection of victims and to maintain the rule of law investigations and accusations like these should be thoroughly conducted and must be taken seriously in light of some of the text messages 
WhatsApp messages where he was talking about um, just all kinds of insidious behavior towards women. We need this to be taken seriously. And hopefully Romania is the country to do it. And if they're not, somebody needs to somewhere. Praying for Andrew Tate in prison is an important way we can show him Christian love and compassion. Even if you're suspicious of Andrew, it's important to remember that Jesus loves us all, no matter what. Instead of focusing on his potential crimes or his actions, try to focus on how Andrew is valuable in the eyes of God and how he loves Andrew in spite of his many mistakes he's probably made. He has recently converted to Islam from Christianity, and this is the perfect time for him to cry out back to the one true God who, you know, he had some foundation with at some point. So I saw the text, of course, and I start to feel like it's hard not to just pray for the women who've been abused in this situation, but we don't even know. I mean, again, innocent until proven guilty. We don't know the full extent. But I've been praying for justice as well, not just for Andrew, but for justice as well. And we need to see the extent of the true crimes that have been committed. And we want to pray for God's justice for potential victims, but also salvation for people involved. So some of you have been watching the Andrew Tate situation. If you don't know who he is, talk about toxic masculinity. That's why he preaches and it's really sad. So I just want to encourage you to pray with me over that. Well, right now we have an incredible program for you called Spiritual Growth Academy. And you can enroll and take a four-week class or do one of our monthly events. It's an amazing, amazing uh, spiritual growth process for you right now that you can have in your life. If you have been growing in spiritual gifts or closer connection to Jesus, and you want a Bible-based approach to do this with a community, we have one for you. It's a subscription-based class platform where you get to a community who's going to speak into your lives. You can grow in our spiritual growth groups or you can attend the classes that are both live and pre-recorded and you get all the back content from the last year we've been filming as well. Well, if you sign up now, you get Modern Profits Bundle, which includes an entire academy, a masterclass on Modern Profits. What are Modern Profits today? What can they do and how can they affect the world around them? And you also get the book Modern Profits. So I'm going to encourage you to get that today. Sign up, become part of this. We do the spiritual heavy lifting of your spiritual growth. And so come join us. So we have a story today that I, I man, I uh, read the book about Prince Harry and it, I had to turn my empathy on you guys on a level that I don't know. It just was, it was really hard to read his new book and not grieve over this person who feels like he's stripped of some level of identity and he's trying to find identity in a lot of relationships like Meghan Markle and others. I really feel like I had more compassion for him, but I also saw such a victim. He seemed very tormented. The first part of the book, it was like so much torment and resentment and small-minded in a major way for somebody who's been given the opportunity has been given. I also think that he's had a huge God purpose on his life and that ultimately it feels like his, you know, in, in her life, he could see her God purpose or he could see destiny in her life that he feels disconnected from, but he also feels like he might be the realizer of that somehow. So his current trajectory is so sad and so hard. And I was just, again, I was super sad for what happened to him. And it helps to define why through his this trauma that he didn't really find support in his family, but he found it in his, his new wife, which is interesting. A life of resentment and disconnect that came from the death of his mother was so obvious. And he blames everyone, but mainly his family. He really, really felt like a victim of his family. You don't see um, Prince Andrew and the rest of the family with the same narrative. So something happened when he was a child. And you can see it again. This first part of the story is so such a suffering story. He basically says in this that the worst sin uh, in all the royal family's history is how they are basically responsible for Diana's death. And so he also blames the press. And there's really no personal ownership for any of his own behavior that came out of this, which is, again, trauma. And he's gone through counseling. He's gone through it, you know, a lot of, it sounds like therapy or coaching, but they just didn't get to the root of this victim mentality. The rest of the royal family experienced the same tragic death, just like I said, including his brother, but their assessment of what happened was not in line with Harry's. So he feels like an outsider and accuser and blames him for all of his pain. And there's lots of creepy stuff going on in here. Maybe it's from the ghostwriter who added a lot of narrative into it. I know Ben Shapiro talked about that. He's like, I think it's a ghostwriter, not Harry, because there was like some weird narratives and storytelling that didn't sound like Harry. And I listened to part of the audio version that I had to go just into reading because it just felt like so heavy spiritually. But it gets even stranger when he meets Megan, who becomes someone that fills the hole in his heart that's really, she took on the role of Diana in his mind. She really is that Diana and he's fighting for her like he's fighting for his mother who no one fought for. And again, he's very troubled human in search of that mom and finds in Megan who's really taking advantage of his situation. I think she's really, she's, I, I don't know I, what kind of person she's. I know she's been touted by people like Dr. Drew Pinsky and others as a narcissist, 
but it's a really small worldview that she comes out of as well. And their show, I know their show has tanked. Um, it's They were expecting on Netflix to help save them and, and some of the ratings, but it, it really tanked and the viewers and reviewers didn't like it at all. Ben Shapiro called it the number one victim book of the year. But as a Christian though, I know that he still has an opportunity to meet God and change. So let's keep praying for him and his royal family. And the release of Prince Harry's new book, The Me You Can't See, has stirred controversy amongst Christian commentators who view the book as not only presenting a victim mentality, but just being a selfish book with its focus on his own mental health battle. Some Christian commentators are concerned that such an outlook fails to acknowledge the role of personal responsibility, including myself. I feel like there's no personal responsibility the whole time. The Christian perspective is that as children of God, we should take responsibility for our lives and strive to seek God's wisdom in all our decisions. And the Bible is full of advice on how to assess and cope with our own emotions and to take responsibility for our actions. As you know, such the focus on mental health that is present in the book seems in many Christian circles as a distraction from the idea of personal accountability, which is a huge statement that I was reading through different critics and I was like, wow, everyone's saying the same thing. They're saying there's no personal accountability, that he's a victim, that he... Basically, it's almost like spiritual exhibitionism or mental exhibitionism where he shows you the process, but there's no resolution. And that was really hard because you're seeing the nakedness of his vulnerability, but it's not unto this incredible building of who he is. And again, that's what their show did. It was like emotional exhibitionism for what? Why did we need to see and hear all those things? And, and obviously, they were caught in several lies that the media on both sides like called them out on for the, you know their documentary. And I just, I feel bad for them. I feel like they're you know, again, this isn't the end of their story, though. They could both turn around and there could be an epic story. What if he is, what if he does have that mantle or that calling of Princess Diana that he feels he and Meghan do? And how can that change the world? Because they still have access. They haven't given up their royal family rights and they haven't given up their their titles. And they're, they're very specific about that. So what happens if they end up, you know, 10 years from now, a different story comes out? Because this is a really, they're going through something, they're putting themselves through something that, is really hard and I feel like they can have a turnaround. So let's keep praying for them. Those of you from the UK and those of you from Sovereign Nations, I know for you guys, this this really matters. This really counts, like you guys feel this. Those of you from more Western countries that don't celebrate the royal family in the same way, it's still a really interesting story for you because you're watching a royal family come unglued in the fabric of the children and possibly the grandchildren. And we wanna just keep our pulse on that because the royal family um, it really defines a lot in the world still and with Queen Elizabeth's passing last year, there is a new changing of the guard and eventually we'll come all the way down to Prince Andrew becoming king. So it'll be really interesting to watch this play out in our generation as it hadn't changed for a couple generations with Prince, uh, Princess uh, or Queen Elizabeth, which is really interesting. So thank you for all your comments. Tell me what you thought if you read Prince Harry's book or if you're interested in reading Prince Harry's book. I can see people coming on from Facebook and YouTube and you guys are leaving lots of comments coming in from all over the place. We have a word in just a few minutes about prodigals returning. This is a prophetic word God gave me. We also have an incredible interview that's going to start right now. And this is with the deliverance priest, uh, Father, uh, I just lost Father's name and I never do this, Father Martins. And so I have a Father Matthias, who's a good friend of mine, Father Martins, who's one of the deliverance priests in the Catholic Church, who's seen stories like you would not believe, you guys. And then him, along with my friend, Ryan Bathia, Man, they're opening files about these battles and these these uh, demonic possessions to the public in a brand new series from iHeartRadio called The Exorcist Files that actually premieres on the 25th this month. You guys are going to want to listen to this. They've done a lot of reenactments. Ryan and his team have gone out and produced so that you guys can hear. You need to feel what was really happening in these moments, not just hear the story, but feel the story. And so we're going to talk to them about this. And I think this is going to be something that maybe you haven't heard before from this point of view a father, a priest from the Catholic Church sharing about current exorcisms. Now, back in 2018 and also in 2020, in both the Catholic and Christian Church, there were surveys done uh, amongst the people about some of the top themes that were needed to be addressed amongst Christianity and Catholicism. And deliverance, there had never been a point in modern history of people asking for deliverance or exorcism like there was in 2018 for the Catholic Church and 2020 for the Christian Church. And it's only increased, which means people can feel the oppression that's on them, they can identify it and they're they're looking for help. So we get to hear from someone who's helping a lot of people and his partner in podcast crime, Ryan. So I'm going to bring you guys on right now. I'm so excited that you guys are coming on and talking to us about this. 
because this, my friends, is something that isn't being talked about in a lot of places. And this is an exclusive interview. I don't know anyone in our stream or world that's doing this. So bring our guests on right now, Glenn, our production podcast friend. Well, here we go. Hi, you guys. Hello, Sean. Good to be here. Hey, Sean. We're so glad you're here. And Ryan, you are obviously not the priest. <laughs> how, how could you tell? Is Well, this this is actually a more Protestant attire, you know. <laughs> well, this is my, this is as minister as I get right here. So here we go. But uh, Father Martins, I want to start with you. I mean, first of all, how long have you been doing exorcism and, and deliverance? Gosh, it's been... Um... Gosh, it, it's uh, coming up on the completion of 20 years, two decades. Wow. And you have like the stories. I, I From what I've gathered, we've seen movies um, where it really kind of exploits sometimes deliverance that's or exorcisms that happen in the Catholic Church. But there's times that you've seen stuff in those movies. And I've, I've read from some of the stuff that Brian sent me that those are nothing compared to the reality. You've seen some realities that go far beyond what we can imagine in the minds of Hollywood. So, so like being in the midst of like seeing that kind of demonic aggression, what keeps you in this field as a priest? Like what keeps you motivated? Well, so so it's two things. Uh, even, you know, an exorcist is is dealing with the devil all the time, but his life is not centered on the devil. It's centered on Christ, yeah. and and so he draws his strength. Uh, fr from Christ. And because Christ uh, has given his life for, for those whom he loves, for, his, for, for, yeah. for mankind. And uh, so those who are ensnared by the devil, I, I, because Christ wants them liberated, that's enough motivation for me. And so it's a realm where really the fight is not fair. Christ is the victor. And we already know how the ending is going to be. Um, so when I go into a, a situation where I'm encountering the devil, I know that in the end, Christ wins. I don't quite know what I'm going to encounter in this case. Uh, but certainly, I mean, you know, the laws of physics don't mean very much in the room when an exorcism is happening in the, in the sense that, you know, you're dealing with a reality that is outside the realm of nature, that is supernatural. And so that there's a collision of two kind of realities there. So you need to be prepared for that. Uh, so in the movie, The Exorcist, I'm, I'm often asked, exorcists are, almost, are often asked, uh, is what occurred, what was portrayed in that movie, is that is that reality? Is that what occurs in an exorcism case? And there's really only one thing in that movie that happened that, um, does not happen. And that is the, the 380 degree turning of the head uh, because a human body would break at that point. Yeah. However, uh, the, the vomiting, the spitting, the contorting of the body, the crawling down the stairs in a crab walk backwards, yeah. levitation, uh, all of that can be par for the course. But, but I also will say this, you know, those things are parlor tricks. They're tricks yeah. of the devil to intimidate. And when I began my career in doing this, when I shouldn't say career, I, when, I, when my ministry in this area began, uh, there were a lot more of those kind of displays than there are now. You know, now, I mean, wow. he can't, he doesn't intimidate me. Uh, I'm not afraid of oh, so him. That's, that's actually you grown in spiritual authority then and understanding in spiritual it's not authority and, and confidence. Yeah. in Christ that Christ wow. is the victor. And so he doesn't spend his energy, so to speak on doing those things. He, wow. he spends it on resisting the, the prayers that I'm praying on behalf of the victim and the, and the conversations that I'm trying to engage the victim in to get the victim to renounce you know, what needs to be renounced so that Christ can can enter into his or her heart in a more profound way. If Christ is in the heart, then the devil can't be in the heart. Oh, that's so good. I mean, I, I so believe that. And I think with Ryan, you have a special 3D mic where you guys are doing reenactments and showing some of the sensational side of, of deliverance ministry. Talk about this, Ryan, why you want it to bring because you guys are doing this for very different reasons. Talk about why you're doing this as a producer and as 
as a podcast, which may end up turning into a T this needs to be a TV show, honestly, but keep going. Yeah, I think, uh, so I was fortunate enough to get to go to the Vatican a few years ago. I was actually doing research for another show. Um, I was fascinated by the process that uh, the Catholic church has for investigating claims of the miraculous for, uh, the canonization process and for saints. And through that, and through a random, not so random, uh, series of events, I got introduced to father Martins and of course there's, you know, I don't know if this is just human depravity, but we're all fascinated like by this. It's just something that's like, you know, they're like, this is interesting. And ultimately, though, um, you know, as a storyteller, there's a tension in every exorcism and deliverance session. And um, one, I am passionate about just uh, illuminating stories that sort of defy uh, our natural conventions, right? Because I'm not a naturalist. I do believe that there's compelling evidence for things that happen outside our framework. Uh, and you know, a vast majority of the world has a prescription and a narrative for, you know, a reality of spirits. And so I just find this academically very interesting. And then ultimately, when we decided to do this as a podcast, uh, one, it's for very good reason. A lot of people ask, how come there's no tapes? How come there's no video inside the room? And, you know, his father will share in this series, it's an extremely serious, uh, very sobering thing. And these are victims. These are not uh, players in a, in a stage. These are people who have experiencing and whether you believe it or not, uh, they're uh, exhibiting behaviors that are embarrassing, uh, toxic, you know, and just things that need to be protected. So we're very serious. We actually take the names, places, identities and change them to protect them. But we also I grew up listening to this old time radio drama, you know, where you'd have the sheet and you'd wave it for thunder. And uh, we've come a long way since then. And so we actually had a vision to take a 3D mic that picks up all the acoustic sound and actually make it as authentic and real since you're not going to get wow. to go in one and wow. hopefully you never have to be in a room with an exorcism right that's that's our hope but um this will give you a uh i think as close to a, a real uh, experience as you would and uh, it's uh the mic is just incredible so we braved uh los angeles and new orleans and atlanta um actually near uh not too far from you uh, in the streets of burbank we do owe an apology to a neighborhood for having a manifestation scene <laughs> at 10 p.m. with a dear friend oh running gosh. down out the street yelling, no life without death. Uh, so I would like to give a shout out to Burbank PD for not responding uh, to any calls. That oh may have occurred at that point. A, well, OK, so here let's get to a story, because Father Martins, you have stories that are unbelievable. That's what you're going over with the podcast. Tell us one of the cases that affected you the most that was maybe one of the most uh, intense with a spiritual battle in it. Because I think a lot of our listeners are like, they they maybe have seen movies or they've seen more traditional deliverance where it's just kind of like, come up to judgment and Jesus will you know overpower you by the in the name of Jesus be delivered that kind of thing. But they haven't and oh bummer. Sorry guys. No, I was asking you to tell us. <laughs> I, I was I was asking you to tell us one of the stories of where somebody it was one of the biggest battles one of the one of the stories that struck you the most in your time as an exorcist. Sure. So, uh, you know, when I one of my first cases, so I was I was a young priest, and a woman came uh, to where I was at in at 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 the parish church where I worked, where I was stationed. And she asked if her house could come and be blessed. And, and the house she was living in was her uncle's house. Hers had been burned in a fire and he was deployed in Afghanistan. Uh, so he wasn't using his house and he, he made it uh, free for her to use. And when she moved in, uh, there was just different phenomena happening. Um, things that were resting safely on the kitchen counter, uh, on the kitchen table would suddenly fall on the floor and break. Or if they wouldn't break, they would they would make a loud noise. Uh, but there was no wind in the room. No one else was in the house and so forth. Their appliances would, would make jittery sounds and kind of, you know, it would sound like the kitchen sink was being was being tossed around inside the fridge. And she opens the fridge and there's nothing wrong with it. And, and it keeps functioning fine. Um, one of the well, the most disturbing thing for her, aside from the fact that she had this sensation that she was being watched. And I think we've all had that sensation at different times where you, you walk right. into a room or all of a sudden, even you, you've been sitting and reading a book and you just feel like there's a set of multiple eyes watching you and you, you can't see anything. You can't 
uh, perceive anyone or anything there, but it just feels like it's there. But aside from that was the fact that there was a music box in her uncle's room that, that would chime away uh, at random yeah. times. And the bizarre thing about that was that no one was there to wind it. So she had been there several months already, and this music box uh, would just had a mind of its own. She had tried to remove it from the house, but it wouldn't lift off the dresser top. And so when I went into the house uh, to bless it, so she opened the door and she wanted me to walk in first, and so I did so. And the ceiling fan in the living room began slightly turning, but just oh, very slowly. And then all of a sudden it was spinning so fast, so quickly that, that it was a blur. You, you, you couldn't see the blades, like spinning way faster than what you've ever seen a ceiling fan spin. And then all of a sudden, snap your fingers and it's at a dead stop. And then it begins spinning backwards and then forwards again and then alternating between the two going very quickly so going going super fast one way immediately super fast the other way and there's no kind of wind up or, or there's no wind down yeah. or wind up time yeah. so i start making holy water so i asked her to fill a bowl of water from from the sink and i started the prayers when i was done that i started an exorcism prayer for the place uh there was no doubt of the woman's sincerity so i had, i had asked i mean she she seemed like a very rational person she was a professional um she had given her life to christ she was living a good life we had talked about that because of course you know so the job of the exorcist is not to cast out the devil. The job of the exorcist is to find out why is the devil there? What rights mm -hmm. has he gained? And then it's his job to work with the victim to rescind those rights. Well, wow. in this case, you know, whatever her uncle was into, she didn't know and and I didn't know. The only thing I I knew was that the devil had gained authority to be in this place. But the brother had given her permission to live there. And so now it becomes her place. So she has authority. And so piggybacking on that, I'm coming in on her behalf saying, hey, you don't have a right to be here. Even if the owner of the place, um, whatever he has done, whatever he's into has given you rights to be here. Guess what? As long as she's here, you don't have those, those rights. So. I went into the bedroom and I saw the music box on the counter. And as I had been, as I was blessing that holy water, or, or maybe I had moved on to the prayers of exorcism for the place, it had started chiming away. So kind of on cue, when I was doing kind of the most visceral action against it, then the music box goes off. And uh, you, you can always count that the devil knows when to play his part. And so I go into that room. I picked up that music box without any effort whatsoever. Uh, That's awesome. I mean, I think she she was being honest. I have no reason to believe that. She was astounded, the fact that it just lifted up. And as soon as I touched it, it stopped. It stopped its chiming. Now, normally a music box, it chimes when you open the lid, right? And then, and then it, that's when the music starts. Well, I never opened the lid. I mean, the lid, it was chiming while the lid was closed. But I, I opened the lid and there was nothing inside this box. There was no mechanism. There, there were no chimes. There was nothing but empty space. So the exterior of the box looked like a typical music box. It had a slot in the side for a wind-up key which the key she had taken out because she thought somehow this thing is being wound. Uh, so she removed the key that had no effect. It continued to, to chime uh, whenever it wanted to. Um, but from that point forward, it's, it never chimed again. Wow. I would have thrown it away. <laughs> well, she, I could have. Have. 
she would have, but it was her <laughs> uncle's. So, I understand. Um, but from that point, you know, there was the, my job there was to exert the authority of this Christian person who uh, was being violated by an evil spirit that was there. Uh, and so I, I went to assert her rights. Uh, so she claimed her faith in Jesus Christ, and that gives us authority, right? That yeah. makes us a member of the kingdom of God. That makes us a, a, a daughter of God the Father. It, it, it opens up for us the, every benefit that Christ has obtained. Uh, and so I was there to assert that. Anything that was going to be in the way of that, you're not welcome here. Get out. And you guys, when you're replaying these kinds of stories, Ryan, you're actually like doing full audio and kind of reenacting the whole thing. So people can feel immersed in the environment of the story. How has that impacted you as a producer, kind of focusing on the demonic side of the story with then there's a redemption. I'm sure the focus on the demonic is a lot. You have to show Goliath before David wins. How has it affected you as far as editing and producing these? Yeah, I mean the the top. I'm naturally, you know me. I love to joke and laugh around, and so I've had to. It's 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 a serious topic, and I appreciate that uh, Father and I are, you know, I think influencing each other. Um, he's turning into a great marketer because that's a great story. Some of the stories we tell are actually far more intense than that one. So, Father, I appreciate you not giving away all the good the good stories. You're gonna have to download it to find out the uh, the rest of them. But honestly, um, I think. You know, you feel weird afterwards. Uh, you feel like you've just studied something very heavy. There's a there's a heaviness on there, and um, and it's a tough line because you're always asking yourself, I don't want to glorify this. I don't want to give it more due attention uh, than is necessary. But I think we kind of view this as a PSA, and regardless of whether you are Catholic, Protestant, you know, secular, atheist, agnostic, whatever, the point is that should you ever experience something like this, uh, you'll and to quote the famous ghost, but like you'll. Who are you going to call? You, like, you know, you'll know you'll have a framework for what to, <laughs> what to deal with this. But uh, the 3D is real. I think it's really interesting. I think we're also just in media. I think we're on the cusp of uh, narrative fiction podcasting. Uh, it's such a great yeah. way to test out material, too. I think there's a whole, uh, no pun intended, but legion of uh, you know podcasts coming that um, when you do this 3D audio, a lot of 3D audio is done in the studio and they layer on different levels. So, you, you know, if you're in a diner, you can add sound effects to make it feel like you're in a diner. And that's cool. We wanted a mic that picked up everything from the vinyl uh, of the booth to the coffee cup sliding on the. I mean, it picks up everything and sort of like Malcolm Gladwell talked about in Blink. You know, there's subtleties that your mind picks up on that we think will lend you when you put those earphones on. And there's a, there's a particular story where Father recounts one of his colleague priests encountering a uh, uh, possessed man who the demon was making the voice project around the room, um, and the 3D audio allows you to hear it on your headphones in every quadrant. So you'll you'll actually hear it upright left behind oh. you. And it's very, it's it's intense. And so it brings you, and it's a cool way of, I think, doing storytelling. We also have a lot of theology in it too. I think, you know, there's a, whenever you're producing something, you have to pick who it's for. There's entertainment in the dramatic reenactments, but, you know, Father and I uh, host it, but there's also guests who come on. We have prominent um, psychiatrists who will attest to patients that they've seen exhibit these behaviors. And I really think Father does a great job of walking through like just the theology, because the vast majority, I mean, as an example, like they sell Ouija boards at Toys R Us, I think like there are like they sell Ouija boards all over the country. And the vast majority of people playing with Ouija boards, I don't think report stories like we report in here. Right. And the mystery, though, is why do some people um, have these problems, um, et cetera? And, you know, we're hoping that after listening to this, you might say, you know, maybe tonight's a monopoly night instead, you know. Oh, my gosh. You know, the average age for Ouija board, it's for eight and up. Isn't that crazy? My daughters are like, you know, eight and, and nine. And I can't imagine them playing with a Ouija board, trying to contact spirits. Right. But what, what tips would you give us to protect ourselves against potential demonic influences, Father Martins? Right. So, you know, and that's at the end of the day, that that's that's the big question. That's, uh, you know, that that's that's what we all need. And, you know, the thing is that uh, we, we were not made for this world. We, we were meant for a yeah. different world. And Christ has paved the way for us to get there. He's purchased the ticket. He's put us in the vehicle that's getting us there. He's unlocked the gates and he's just waiting for us. So our Christian faith cannot be just one thing, one good in the midst of all the other goods we have going on. It has to be the thing, the central thing about our life. I and love that. 
if 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 we live our lives with that so that means we 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 can't listen to every song that's produced out there we we can't watch every movie that's out there we can't a christian has to have an editing button in his mind that's like you know what this is incompatible with my faith i don't need this in my life and even though this might be entertaining for me i i'm i this is incompatible with my christian faith and i certainly wow. would not watch this movie if christ was sitting here next to me but guess what he is right he is and and so that kind of attitude even with regard to what friends we have what kinds of activities we will do as friends a, a, a christian has to purify his life and that is the the greatest thing you can do the best most effective thing to keep the devil out of your life i love that so much i was thinking about i've never shared this before but years ago when i was in my 20s uh i lived with like four guys and my sister came to stay with us and we ended up turning on one of those like really demonic horror movies and i'm not a horror movie person but we were watching it and it had like a, a demonic korean water ghost spirit type thing in it and my sister ran she was sleeping in a room and she ran out of the room and we paused the movie on a part she wouldn't know what it was and she said I just had this nightmare, but when I woke up, I was there. There was like this girl with like black hair in front of her, and it was a demon. And I could feel in my spirit like Jesus was saying, "Whatever's happening in the house right now needs to stop, or you're letting something in." And so she, we started looking at each other, like, "Oh my gosh, we got just that feeling of chills, but also the the sanctity of God of where He was protecting us yeah. from going too far down that path of thinking this is just a movie, but it's actually." A, an opening or a doorway to open ourselves up to fear and to the demonic presence. And so it was one of those moments where I was so grateful that walking with God and having a community like my sister walking with God helped us all to shut that door and keep that door closed in our lives. But some people are playing with whether it's movies or video games or whether it's Ouija boards or whether it's just bad sinful patterns in their life that they think there's no consequences to. And what you're seeing is that not only is there reaping and sowing consequences of every human being, but sometimes there's a spiritual influence and a consequence because of the spiritual realm. And I think it's so powerful that you've spent your life on this and helped so many people to make the right agreements with God and come into alignment. It's so awesome. Well, tell me this, what, what's the most rewarding aspect of your, of your ministry? Oh gosh, seeing somebody free, seeing somebody yeah. who's no longer being tortured, seeing someone who now finally is able to receive the 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 reward of being a christian the peace the delight the tranquility uh to ex experience the love of god and have nothing threaten that i mean that that is by far the biggest reward like that is the most energizing thing um i i just that's so beautiful my favorite that's it i mean that's so beautiful yeah yeah praise god praise god so I, I cut out a little bit there. Ryan, I want to ask you as a final follow-up question. Yeah. Um, what's the most rewarding thing? And then tell us how to get the podcast. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, uh, you know, I think one thing that uh, I, I hope that this brings and has been rewarding for me is that I think regardless of how one approaches this uh, from their own beliefs about God or spirituality is that, you know, we are, I think there's a consensus in our society that we are not just uh, mind and body, but we are also spirit, um, and that there is a there's a thir there's another dimension to us as human beings. And these stories tell about people who are afflicted in that particular realm. Um, and so I love just being able to find people who are smart, credible, um, and sincere. Who I mean, I've just interviewed so many people now who share these stories of what happened. So I'm left with, you know, you can doubt a lot of these, you can doubt the veracity of some of the stuff that's brought up. But the truth is, I mean, t it, depending on the polls, a little less than half of Americans believe in ghosts and spirits. Uh, uh, and the vast majority of the world uh, does believe that this is at least a reality. And so anything that raises awareness about the fact that I don't think we are just, you know, DNA replicating machines, that there's something else out there that makes us you know, human beings that we have that divine spark. And, and this is a weird way of backing into that by the hope is that if this stuff, because people always ask me like, oh my gosh, this is so scary. And I was like, but you understand if this is real and I'm going to play the skeptic host on this, but if it's real, then actually this is great news because that's how much more so the solution is even more real. 
Um, and yeah. all these cases will end. But there's a hopeful note in this, right? These people and these in these stories, they find freedom, they find hope, and the tension is figuring out, you know, how did I get that? So that's there's a there's an upbeat note there that I I find very rewarding. Um, the show comes out January 25th. Uh, on all podcast platforms. So wherever you get the language that I'm always supposed to say is that uh, it's available on Apple Podcasts, the iHeartRadio app, or wherever you get your podcast. So as soon as you're done listening to Sean Bowles' podcast, you want to go right now, The Exorcist Files, you want to subscribe, you want to tell all your friends, and January 25th, um, heads will spin. Well, actually, not really, because <laughs> Father pointed out that's not really. he just anatomically pointed wrong. it out. You can't even use that anymore. Well, you guys, thank you so much, Ryan and Father Martins. Thank you for being on here. And I'm going to encourage you to get that podcast now. I just downloaded the first kind of just the intro or the teaser for it, and it's awesome. So thank you guys for being on. I'm going to send you away now. Thanks for a great interview. Thanks for being with us. And I, I just know God's going to use this podcast in a powerful way. I'll see you guys again. Hopefully we can do a follow-up. All right. Thank you. God Absolutely. bless you. Remember, shoots and ladders, Sean. Stick to that. It's the most innocuous game, all right? So <laughs> exactly. No Ouija board shoots ladders. You heard it here from my head, but the, uh, thank you guys. Well, here we go. This is, it's so powerful to have these kinds of interviews and hear what God's doing in different quadrants of the world. And we do this because of generous donations from people just like you. And so thank Thanks for those of you today on Facebook who gave stars. Thanks for those of you who gave money on YouTube. Uh, the best way to give finances and support us is to go into bullsministries.com and click on giving or donate because that way you can actually get a tax deductible receipt as well as become a partner where we get to give back to you. So we actually give resources back to our partners, which is people who choose to go on an ongoing partnership with us to help fund the equipment we need, the team we need, the staff it takes to make podcasts just like this and our other series that we have out as well, Exploring the Marketplace, Exploring the Prophetic. And I'm gonna encourage you guys to become part of our partners, part of our donors, and it's going to change your world as well. You're going to benefit from it as well. But I have a prophetic word for you, and I want to share it with you right now. And this is so exciting to me. As I was praying this week, I really felt like this is always true. There's something that's always true about this statement, but it's really going to be realized truth in our generation. We're going to see a season of homecoming. I kept feeling like the church is, is going to have a homecoming dance. You know, that the, the, the Christian and Catholic church, we're going to start to see prodigals coming home. And in Christianity, we have this endearing term for people who've lost their way, which is called prodigal. If they've left their faith or they've rebelled against love. And the term prodigal refers to someone who's strayed from the right path, particularly in spiritual sense. In Christianity, the term is often used to describe someone who's turned away from their faith, who's living in a state of sin. And the parable of the prodigal son told by Jesus in Luke 15, 11 through 32 is a powerful illustration of love and forgiveness of a loving father, a loving God for who those who strayed from him. And in the parable, the younger son asks his father for his inheritance, then goes to a far off country and wastes his wealth in wild, crazy living. And when he realizes his mistakes, he comes back to his father who welcomes him back with open arms and celebrates his return. This parable also teaches us that God never stops loving his children and that his mercy and forgiveness are always available for those who repent and return to him. It also shows God's love extends to the prodigals and how much he desires for them to come back. And so many of us desire prodigals to come home right now. Some of the people called in the world don't look very empowered right now because they're not living connected to God's original purpose to their life. And they're not living in connection to Jesus. These are leaders in homeless shelters right now. They may not be a leader in the shelter, but they're homeless. They're CEOs right now who are going through drug rehab. And there's artists who are trapped in mental pain and mental illness. And there's those who you would look at today and never imagine what God sees. It's a powerful, anointed, beautiful soul. Some of your potential best friends, some of your family members who are going to be the closest to you but aren't right now, employees that will be the best ones in your company, and even people who belong in those church seats that are in your church that are empty right now that are going to be contributors to your congregation, they're out there doing the wrong things right now. But a lot of them have a Christian foundation or they have biblical roots. And the Lord says, this is what the Lord told me this week, this is a season where I'm sending angels all around the world to gather prodigals. Though a prodigal may have wandered far from home, my love for them never wavers. I am the shepherd who searches for the lost sheep, and I will leave no stone unturned to bring them back to my fold. The prodigals may have squandered their inheritance, but I offer them a new inheritance, eternal life in my kingdom, and a life I've chose for them here on the earth. So have faith for I'm bringing your loved ones back to salvation. They may have been lost, but now they are found. And my prophecy to you today is that some of the prodigals that you love the most or that have strayed the furthest that you don't even have hope for, they're just cold right now in their hearts to the love of God and the presence of God are about to come home. 
pray with a new passion. Think about them, like treasure them, be present with them in your heart. Pray with a new passion. Keep your heart open to them because some of them are going to go through a serious transformation in this next season. Just like we've seen over the past few years, some major people in mainstream culture and society have made major turns back to God and aligned with their true calling. Everyone from Denzel Washington becoming a minister, Bob Dylan sharing his faith and even allowing his movie to be faith centric. Justin Bieber having a great turnaround and experience a move of faith in Jesus. I shared the story of MIA last week, who's a beginning fledgling Christian who, uh, you know, she, she knew who Jesus was, but she never saw him as a powerful man and had a vision. And now as a, as a believer, we're seeing that, you know, people who have Christian roots are, are seeing Jesus in a way of sp spending their lives on him. It's going to be a great homecoming for many. And God wants to put you in the core of that relationship of gift of faith. In the story of the prodigal, we're not supposed to relate to the older brother or the younger brother. I don't know if you've ever thought of this before, but we're not supposed to think of the older brother or the younger brother, but we're supposed to relate our hearts to the father who generously opens his entire house, his heart to those who are coming back, fully welcoming back and receiving them back to their home. And that's who you're supposed to be right now. So I'm going to encourage you to keep your heart open, pray for those kids, those grandkids, pray for those friends. I mean, so many of the friends I've had from the time I was in my 20s, even who were in ministry, aren't even walking with God anymore. And I believe that God's going to be calling them back to purpose. And it'll be like no time's lost because Jesus redeems all things. And I believe that many of you are going to see the same thing. And we're going to watch an awakened church. A lot of people who believe in a lot of, you know, extremely bad ideas right now are going to get awakened to Jesus and get awakened to surrendering their lives and sacrificing their lives because he paid such a big sacrifice for us. And they're going to be in touch with the presence of God that way. So thank you for watching this week's show. Keep sending in comments, stories, and testimonies. I love these stories. I love these testimonies. Each week, we can bring you eat more of what you're hungry for. We're trying to help you to discern the times you're in, helping to expose you to things maybe that you haven't heard before or that you haven't heard in a long time. And this show is made because of people like you. So make sure to keep discerning. And we love you.